Over the next hour, we'll get an update on the Ebola response in the U.S. But first, we wanted to give you an international perspective. The British newspaper The Independent writes that the director of the World Health Organization in Europe warns that the spread of the disease across Europe is unavoidable because of extensive travel both from Europe to the affected countries and the other way around. But the WHO director says the continent should be well prepared to control the disease. And the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is following the story of the first Ebola case outside Africa. Spain has quarantined three health care workers after a nurse assistant was infected with the disease. The nursing assistant was part of a team that cared for a Spanish priest who died of Ebola last month. Now the Defense Department briefs reporters on the U.S. military response to the outbreak, including 4,000 personnel on the ground in Liberia. This is 20 Minutes. Afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, proud to welcome into the briefing room General David Rodriguez, Commander of Africa Command. He's here to give you an update on uh, U.S. contributions to the effort against Ebola, U.S. military contributions to the effort against Ebola uh, in uh, West Africa. And with that, sir, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. By the way, I'll moderate, and uh, so I'll be choosing you. we got 30 minutes total for this. Okay, well, good morning. Good to see you all again. I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you about how U.S. Africa Command is supporting the comprehensive U.S. government effort to help contain the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. As you know, the President considers containing the spread of Ebola to be a national security priority that requires mobilizing our collective resources to enable the success of the international effort. Recently, I discussed the progress of the response with the President, who underscored the pivotal role of American leadership in containing the epidemic at its source. In support of the U.S. government effort, the military focus is on providing logistics, training, and engineering support in conjunction with the greater interagency effort. We stood up a headquarters, Joint Force Command, United Assistance in Monrovia, Liberia, to provide regional coordination of U.S. military support to the U.S. and international relief efforts. Finally, we placed two additional mobile medical labs into operation last week significantly increasing the capacity for rapidly diagnosing Ebola. We are also establishing a facility capable of training healthcare support workers, enabling healthcare workers to safely provide direct medical care to patients. Now this is very important and I want you to, to help us to tell our families and the American public the health and safety of the team supporting this mission is our priority. Let me assure you by providing pre-deployment training, adhering to strict medical protocols while deployed, and carrying out carefully planned reintegration measures based on risk and exposure, I am confident that we can ensure our service members' safety and the safety of their families and the American people. As we deploy America's sons and daughters to support this comprehensive effort, we will do everything in our power to address and mitigate the potential risk to our service members, civilian employees, contractors, and their families. Preventing the spread of Ebola is the core task of this effort. This is a key requirement in everything that we do in this operation, and this applies both to our support efforts and the protection of our own people. The professionals of Doctors Without Borders have a remarkable, remarkable record of safe operation in their fight against the spread of Ebola. We have looked at their procedures and consulted with the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, and others to develop our protocols based on known risks and prudent planning. We are taking the following steps to ensure the safety of our people. We are implementing procedures to reduce or eliminate, eliminate the risk of transmission to service members as they go about their daily missions while deployed, including the use of personal protective equipment, hygiene protocols, and constant monitoring. So again, let me assure you, by providing the pre-deployment training, adhering to strict medical protocols while deployed, and carrying out carefully planned reintegration measures based on risk and exposure, I am confident that we can ensure our service members' safety and the safety of the American people. In the end, our equipment, training, procedures, and most of all, the discipline of our leaders and our force will help us to ensure that our team accomplishes the mission without putting our nation and fellow citizens at risk. And as I said before, stopping the spread of this disease is the core mission here. We're all focused, our effort, we are focused in all of our efforts to accomplish this, both by supporting the international effort and by keeping our own people as safe as we can. And with that, 
I'll take your questions. Thank you. Okay, we'll do I'll, I'll moderate if you identify uh, who you're on here with when uh, we ask the question. Start with Lita. General Lolita Baldor with AP. Um, there's been some questions about the whether the response to the overall crisis has been too slow. Do the troops that you have now, uh, will they, are they enough to get the job done, do you think? Or do you think in order to move things along more rapidly and construct some of the facilities more quickly, do you think you're going to need more troops there? And secondly, do you have a cost estimate yet on the military response? Uh, well, first of all, one of the challenges, as you can imagine here, is continuing to gain and grow situational understanding over time because of the uh, some of the isolated places that uh, is creating problems. So we're supporting the USAID efforts uh, to do that. And right now, uh, the leadership uh, has approved uh, up to, uh, you know, almost 4,000 people, as uh, um, Admiral Kirby talked to you about. And I ha we have a, a lot of flexibility to put people in there as they're needed and who's needed. Uh, so I think right now we have uh, the sufficient capacity and numbers to do that. The speed at which these things are done is it's, it's, a, it's not just one challenge with doing that. Part of it is the ability of the uh, uh, host nation to absorb it. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, their infrastructure and their, uh, uh, their capacity to house people to feed people and all that is uh, limited, so it's all going to have to come in in a, a very, very carefully uh, orchestrated based on the demand out, uh, out at the front. At the same time, they're increasing their situational uh, understanding over time. So just as an example of that, these mobile labs are very, very important because, as you can imagine, a lot of, some people have malaria, some people have the flu, and it's really important to find out who you have to treat and who you don't. So we've already flowed uh, two more of those in that are already having a major impact. And we have uh, several more on the way uh, to better uh, uh, adjust it. But again, that wasn't what we expected when we got the first mission. So we, I think we have the right flexibility and ability to, to adjust as needed, ma'am. Cost? Uh, the cost <laughs> estimates uh, right now are, uh, are probably around uh, $750 million for our efforts. And that's in about a six-month period. And again, the challenge with uh, doing that is that those labs, for example, were not in the current, you know, in the initial plan. So it's going to have to be a, a free-flowing, uh, flexible adjustment on all that, ma'am. Uh, Jim McLeshevsky with NBC. General, uh, will any U.S. military personnel be involved uh, in the direct treatment of any Ebola patients or in the training that health care givers, will they be uh, come into contact with any Ebola patients? Patients. No, now the mobile labs are different, but no for the, the majority of the force. The mobile labs are testing people, okay, and some of them will have the Ebola, uh, uh, Ebola virus. Now, those are trained at the highest level of uh, something like uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical, uh, so they're all trained at a very, very high level, and they've been uh, the, um, the one from Walter Reed has been operating there for many years, for example. And the two that we just deployed uh, are meet those standards of uh, of training. Do you, do you have any numbers of those who will be involved in the lab operations, and what what kind of protections, uh, or what kind of protocol will they observe? Uh, and if any U.S. military personnel should contract Ebola, what is the protocol there? What happens? Yes. Uh, uh, first, on the uh, uh, the numbers in the labs, there are between a three and a four person team. We have three labs deployed right now. We will probably deploy several others. Uh, so it'll add one lab, adds three to four additional people. And again, those people are trained to the very highest level of operating in a nuclear, biological, and chemical uh, arena, and they get tested continually. And they're the ones who are testing all the people. Uh, they will be the primary ones that come in contact with anybody. Uh, on the, uh, the second point, if somebody does uh, contract uh, Ebola and becomes uh, uh, symptomatic, they will be handled in a, uh, just like you've seen uh, on the recent ones who came back on an on a aircraft that was uh, specially designed to bring them back, and they'll go back to one of the centers that is uh, specially designed to, uh, to handle the Ebola patients right now. So they'll be returned to the U.S.? Yes, they will. Yes. Okay. 
Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. Sir, um, will U.S. Armed Forces personnel be working side by side with Liberian troops as they build these emergency treatment units? Uh, I thought we had been told that they would be separate from the Liberian forces. Is there a risk of um, contamination by working closely with the partner nation's uh, troops? First question, and are you, do you have enough of the personal protective equipment that you need, or is there a shortage of that? And have you stockpiled any of this ZMAP, the, the, uh, the treatment that was given to the, the two missionaries that had been proven uh, in case troops are exposed to the virus? Uh, we, are, uh, we have people that will be working with and observing the other people who are building the ETUs, whether it be the Armed Forces of Liberia, our contractors to ensure that they're meeting the standards and oversight, uh, that all the people who are doing that are, are tested and meet all the medical protocols to ensure that they do not have the disease. And then the continual daily checks are also a part of it. So all the people that we're working with go through that, those medical protocols. Uh, on the last point uh, on the, uh, uh, the virus, we do not have that stockpiled. And uh, right now, that is, uh, you'll have to get the, the uh, expert uh, opinion of the CDC, but that's still to be determined whether it's effective or not. And they have a date in the future when it, uh, they may be able to tell whether it's effective or not. So we are not stockpiling that. And last, we have sufficient uh, personal protective equipment for ourselves, and uh, we will continue to make sure that that's the way throughout the process. Mm -hmm. uh, General uh, Andrew Tillman with the uh, Military Times. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where these three or four thousand uh, service members will be housed, and uh, can you give us a little bit more information about what kind of personal protective gear are we talking about, what kind of hygiene protocols are we talking about, and what kind of monitoring is going to be done on a daily basis? Yes, for the uh, uh, for the uh, the majority of the uh, the people, they will be uh, in places like the Minister of Defense or some of the uh, uh, the military posts uh, that are out there. Uh, some will be. Uh, uh, over at the airfields and the locations where people will be flowing in uh, personnel and equipment. Uh, we will have trainers that are in a training facility and most of these places that are in and around Mon Monrovia are actually in, in buildings. Uh, the people will either live in the Minister of Defense uh, areas or they will uh, live in uh, tent city type uh, uh, procedures where everything will be uh, taken care of for them to include their food and water and those things because you have to watch all that obviously at, uh, at these points. And then on the, um, uh, the, the protocols that uh, occur in a daily monitoring, mainly it's built around uh, um, the multiple washings that uh, you have to do with, uh, uh, with your, your hands and feet and everything else. I mean, when you go in one of these uh, Ebola treatment units, uh, you're going to wash your hands and feet multiple times. You're going to get your temperature taken in and out. And uh, then there is a checklist of things to ask each personnel uh, based on the, uh, uh, the virus or any other sickness, quite frankly, that could be uh, coming up. Okay. It's just like a self-questionnaire and a checklist. The personal, gear? the personal protective gear, the majority of the people uh, will just uh, deploy with uh, personal protective gear that uh, includes gloves and uh, masks and things like that. They don't need the whole suit as such because they're not going to be in contact with uh, any of the, the people. David. Dave Martin with CBS. Uh, understanding your point about the ability of <clears throat> Liberia to absorb yes. all this stuff, you still you have the feeling that if uh, say the American Embassy were under attack in Liberia, it wouldn't take the 101st Airborne weeks to get there. So what is it that is, uh, what is it about this operation that makes it to seem to be unrolling in a much uh, slower pace than, than sending U.S. troops to protect Americans, for instance? There's, uh uh, the, the Protect the Americans piece is a, a small number. We already have about five times what we've uh, sent in, for example, in, uh, in Libya to protect the U.S. Embassy in that situation. And that infrastructure was there as well as all the ability to sustain themselves. The other challenge out there in, uh, in Liberia is, as you can imagine, their whole uh, nation is, is overwhelmed. Their health facilities are overwhelmed. They're, they're, that's all broken down. Uh, so, uh, so we have to bring in everything at the same time. And again, they, they, right now, they, the ETUs, for example, aren't even located all the locations where they want them. 
So, uh, so those are some of the challenges that we're being faced with that, uh, you know, we just can't, uh, we just don't want to overwhelm them and press things in there that cannot, uh, they can't absorb at all. The airfield is the same way, for example. Okay. Uh, Kate Brennan from Foreign Policy. Could you tell us how the decision was made um, to not have U.S. military medical personnel treat Ebola patients directly? And do you have any concerns about manning these um, Ebola treatment units uh, on the ground? Mm. There's been calls from doctors at borders that m more people are needed, not necessarily more facilities, although both are needed. So if you could ask, answer one of those, please. I'm not so sure about how the decision was made, but the bottom line is that's the position right now of the, of the leadership. It's uh, the international community's role right now, and uh, that's where everybody is encouraging people to come forward to do that, and, uh, and that's where, uh, where we stand until we move you know, to some future thing that they'll, re they'll re continue to relook the decision and, and continue to adapt to what's required on the ground. Again, we're filling in the demands that the, that the international community needs us to do. That's for command and control, it's for engineering support, it's for logistics, and, and those type of things, okay? So that's where we're focusing our effort, okay? And that's what they've asked us to. So, um, <clears throat> do you believe right now that there's a, there, there's a scenario that you can see that would push you past 3,900 or 4,000? And on the, and the question of, uh, of security there, do you think the concerns in Congress about the security of U.S. troops there being uh, just contamination risks or uh, force protection um, in a situation where people were trying to get into an area that was off limits. Do you think that those concerns are overblown? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, our, our service members, wherever they go, they have the ability to defend themselves and protect themselves, and they'll have that here. And I think that uh, uh, that will, uh, you know, we'll meet that standard no matter where we go anywhere in the world, and we're going to do that here, too. So what are the rules of engagement if it's a contaminated person who's unarmed? The, uh, we have the same rules of engagement we have everywhere we go. It's the standard uh, chairman and uh, SECDEF approved rules of engagement, and that's about protecting themselves in self-defense. But I want to make sure you also understand when these people get infected, and uh, they, they are not capable of, uh, you know, doing a, you know, a, a mounted attack or anything. The, the, when they're coming, the only ones that get into ETUs are the very, the sickest ones because, you know, cause just because of a cap capacity problem. and. Uh, they don't, they don't have the ability to, uh, to move or any of those things. So they have had zero problems that I know of in the, uh, in the Ebola treatment units right now, handling people at the gates with a very small element. Okay? And uh, 4,000, 4,000? Uh, the 4,000, when you say, you know, I mean, it depends how everything goes. I can't answer that question right now. But I mean, I don't, I don't foresee more than that right now, but things can change. I mean, this is a, a fastly changing situation. Again, we're still, gaining situational understanding throughout the whole region. So I think that uh, that will be the driving factor. Okay. General. Uh, Phil Ewing with Politico. Can you please give us your latest estimate about how long it's going to take to get all the treatment centers and do the other work uh, you need to do up and running? And can you give us a sense of how long large numbers of American troops are going to be on this mission and doing this deployment? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the treatment centers uh, to get uh, the ones that we have been tasked to build right now will uh, probably take until mid-November right now. Uh, they are working on an effort over there to get more people to uh, build some of those uh, uh, at different times, so we'll just have to see how it flexes out. Uh, we will probably, uh, you know, be able to uh, um, uh, continue to uh, improve the speed with which we build them because after you get one done, the second set goes faster, but that's the estimate right now to get all uh, the 17 done. And what was the second question? I'm sorry. How long are significant numbers of U.S. troops going to be doing this? Do you think? I, I, the, the real critical thing to this based on the USAID and the CDC is to get about 70 percent of the personnel that are infected into a treatment facility. And then at that point, they believe the curve will start going down. And then, uh, then it will be based on uh, how fast and how effectively, one, the curve turns down, and two, the international community can then pick up all the requirements. So we're going to stay as long as we're needed, but not longer than we're needed. Do you have a sense if that's six months, a year longer? No, I, I do not at this point. I mean, I'm sure it'll be about a year, uh, you know, at this point, but that's just a guess. And again, we'll have to play that by year because it's all about the, the function of the transmission rates and when that curve starts going down.
General Joe Tabit with Al Hura. Uh, could you give us a sense about the uh, your cooperation with regional countries uh, in West Africa? And do you think other countries other than Liberia are uh, are safe now from the Ebola outbreak? outbreak? Uh, no, as you know, both Sierra Leone and Guinea are also threatened by this. Uh, we are working uh, just in uh, for the military with both uh, the French and the. Uh, uh, UK, who are also doing some things like putting uh, the hospital up, like our 25-person hospital, and uh, but most of those efforts are being run and controlled by the United Nations and the international community. So we just uh, you know coordinate with them and communicate with them, but not we don't direct them or anything. Christine, thank you, thanks, General. Um, Christina Wong from the Hill. Uh, about the cost, um, can you can you tell us where the 750 million is coming from? Is that coming from OCO out of the continuing resolution? And do you anticipate uh, the Pentagon needing to request more money in 2015 for the response? Uh, you'd have to ask the uh, the comptrollers for that. But the bottom line, it's a reprogramming effort, and I don't know where that's coming from. But they're working that on the on the hill and. Uh, and uh, OSD policy is leading that effort, so they'd be the ones who could tell you exactly where it's coming from. Okay. Do you have time for two more? Uh, thank you, General. I just wanted to clarify one thing. It is, in fact, troops who w and service members who will be operating these testing labs in the field, correct? That's correct. And so we've been told repeatedly up to this point from this podium that, in fact, service members are not going to come in contact with patients, and now we're being told that that's changing. Which the is labs. The labs. Are, are a separate specialty element of the force. So that's, uh, that's probably where that has come. As far as the general population, they okay. won't be coming in contact. These are, like I said, these labs are trained to a specialty skill level four, it's called, but the bottom line, it's the highest level. I mean, they can operate in a nuclear, biological, and chemical environment. They are spe spe specifically trained to do that, and that's their primary skill set. Okay, and uh, we had one in there that has been operating for several years in the country that works on infectious diseases. We have uh, the, both the Navy and the Army have medical labs in many countries doing just that to, to monitor these things. Okay. And, okay. and how many do you expect, how many troops will be running these labs? As I mentioned, there will be three or four per lab. It's a, it's a testing facility, okay, and they test it in a, uh, in a full up. Uh, biological uh, um, uh, suited up. I mean, these people, like I said, meet the highest level of standards of, of operating in that environment, okay? Just a clarification on that, please. Will yes. they be in contact with individuals or just specimens? They come in okay. contact with the individuals okay. and they do that. And they're, like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very high standard that these people have operated in all their lives and this is their primary skill. This is not a, a uh, you know, just medical guys trained to do this. This is what they do for a living, sir. And how many labs total would be? There are three labs deployed right now and operating, and there's been a request for four more labs, and we're uh, working to generate that right now because, as I mentioned, that's the, the testing really focuses who you need to treat and who you don't need to treat because, uh, like I said, malaria uh, shows a similar problem with the symptoms. So uh, that's, uh, that they have already had a major impact uh, and uh, the more, the, the better for, uh, for the effectiveness of the effort. Last question, Richard. Uh, General, uh, when do you expect General Valesky to be on the ground, and why is he replacing General Williams? The, uh, uh, the way that uh, the command and control is set for the, the uh, component uh, for USARAF is that it has the ability to do small humanitarian things for a very short period of time, okay? And then uh, that is, uh, again, this, this is not a small effort and it's not a short period of time. Uh, so then we'll, uh, we'll get, uh, get a uh, headquarters from the United States out there to do that. And then General Williams uh, also has a uh, significant uh, job doing lots of other things every single day that uh, we need him working on in the rest of Africa. And that's the way uh, the design structure of the command and control is set up. And sir, when, uh, when will General Valesky get there? No, uh, he'll be there in the next uh, three weeks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you coming. Thank, Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you.